There we go. Now the, that's working. You should connect in just a second. Can you hear me? What? <laughs> Smart Alec. <sighs> All right, you should be up and running in just a second. Yes, it should be on. Now where was I before I was Sowing distracted? And Sowing and reaping. Yes, thank you. So um, where we talked about sowing and reaping and how some people sow and some people reap, um, and, and and it seems, are, is it still not working? No, not working? There we go. I'm sorry, I, that was mean of me, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. We're in John chapter 4, verse 37. The people are going to be. What? Oh, did you stop and restart it? Thank you. It's greatly appreciated. All right. Um, One soweth and another reapeth. John chapter 4, verse 37. Now, last week we talked about, um, about he that reapeth receiveth wages and how we can lay up rewards in heaven and things like that. And that some sow, some plant, some reap. Um, and, and Jesus is just reiterating here, and herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. So Jesus is saying something here. This is an interesting little concept here. Jesus is saying something here that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, he is, so what, what Jesus is essentially doing here in John chapter 4 is assigning inspiration to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 hasn't been, I mean, it, it, Jesus is saying this when? About 30 A.D.? Corinthians happen. About 65, I was thinking, somewhere around there. Yep, I have 58 in mind, so yeah, so that's about, uh, about 58. So 28 years before it happens, Jesus says something that Paul says, right? He's giving credence to something Paul says, even though it happened 28 years ahead of it. Ahead of it. So he's assigning inspiration to it, right? Um, and, and this is long before it was actually said. Um, and, and the thing about inspiration is this book, and I'll harp on this book night and day if you let me, this book is inspired. It has to be. If it's not inspired, then I have no business standing behind this little lectern teaching you guys about it, right? And people have come up with some weird, I mean really weird things when it comes to inspiration, right? So there's a couple theories about inspiration. And, and when I, I'm sorry, some of you guys are going to be like, I don't really care about any of this. I just know I have the Bible in my hand. This. Sam Gipp is a guy who is a Bible guy. He knows all of the manuscripts, he does manuscript evidence, and he does all this stuff. So these are kind of some, uh, some different theories as to as man, that man has come up with along uh, throughout the years as, as far as inspiration goes. So the first one he talks about is called the naturalistic theory, meaning the scripture is not really inspired at all. It's just a collection of semi-accurate history. Okay, um, and it's got some historical mythology, you know, mixed in there with it when it comes to Genesis. When it comes to anything that Moses wrote, it was, it's, most of it's just myth. This is where all your scientists land. They'll use the Bible as a, as a reference for history, um, but they'll say it's semi-accurate history and it's mixed with mythology. This is where all your scientists believe, right? Um, not all your scientists, but the, you know, uh, I know I happen to know a few scientists that are that are actually pretty good as far as their Bible believing. They believe doctrine and they use science, not falsely so called, um, and uh, and they actually use it to prove the scripture. Right? And then you have the neo orthodox theory of inspiration. God did not actually inspire the Bible, but He can use the Bible. Very much in the same way that he can use the Quran, very much in the same way that he can use any religious text in order to prove his existence, right? So that's a theory that 
spiritualists will say, people who are religious in nature but don't necessarily believe in the inspiration of the scriptures, right? He didn't actually inspire, it's just we have this book and it just so happens to be that God can use the book because God's all-powerful, right? They believe in an all-powerful God, they believe in a God, but they don't believe that the book is inspired. And, and I don't, I mean, that's, that to me is kind of half, half in, half out, right? They're wishy-washer, they're sitting on the fence. Old, right? Right? Okay. And then you have the partial inspiration theory, meaning that some of the scripture is inspired, but not all of it. Um, so this is um, people who, who call themselves scholars who try to pick and choose what's inspired and what's not inspired, right? Uh, this is the partial inspiration. This is where the Catholic Church falls. Genesis is a myth. Genesis chapter 1, well actually almost all of Genesis is a myth. All of the creation, all of that stuff is, is just, it's an allegory that is used to try to tell us how God did something without actually telling how God did something. Well, I don't know, every time I read the book of Genesis it said God did this, right? I don't think that's partial inspiration. I don't think that's mythical at all, right? So that's the partial inspiration. Genesis is a myth. Moses is something they call poetic history. Um, and the promised land does not belong to Israel. That's what they'll say, right? These are the people who fall into this partial inspiration. These are some of your scholars, right? Then you have something called the concept theory. This is where you get the NIV from. The NIV translation is not a word-for-word -word translation. It's a thought-for-thought -thought translation. Right? So that's the concept there. God inspired the basic thoughts, not necessarily the words, right? Men use their own words to um, express God's thoughts. This is the NIV, the Good News Bible, the Living Bible. They're all thought for thought translations as opposed to word for word. I remember there was a time that I was I was at my, my grandmother's church. And he was teaching, he was preaching on something, and uh, this is the church that she went to that I don't like many years ago. And uh, he was teaching on something, and he was using his NIV, and I was reading from my King James, of course. And I appreciated his message. It was actually very good. Um, but I think the NIV had, I mean, the, the King James had something, an, a word in there that would better solidify his point. I was trying to say, I, I really did appreciate what you were saying, and look what the King James says. This is exactly what you're saying, but this word here helps, I don't even remember what it was. It was so long ago helps to really bolster your argument. And uh, he says, oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. That's really good, I'll have to use that next time. And then I was like, it must be nice to be able to just switch and jump at whenever we want, right? Um, but he says, yeah, and I understand, I, I can appreciate the King James. The King James is a word for word translation and the NIV is a thought for thought. So it really says the same thing. And I went, no it doesn't. Absolutely it does. Actually, I'll show you. Um, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 2, when we get into it, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 2, it says, Now there, at, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is in the Hebrew tongue called Bethsaida, having five porches. Right? You know what the NIV says there? In the Aramaic tongue. As a matter of fact, 11 times where the Bible says Hebrew, the NIV says it's Aramaic. And they do that to try to get you to believe a Catholic version of the Scripture. The long story short, that was pushed by the Catholic Church to get you to believe that Jesus was speaking Aramaic in most circumstances as opposed to Jews, so uh, Hebrew, so that they can try to push an Aramaic translation of a certain verse, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, right? They change something in there and use Aramaic words in order to make the rock Peter, as opposed to the rock Christ, right? So they, they completely ignore that in Hebrew, they, the word here in that verse is Petra, right? Uh, and Petra means rock, or is the feminine word for Peter, right? Which doesn't make any sense. It would, it would be Patricia or something like that, right? The, the word that's actually there is Petros, which is the masculine form for Peter. 
So they try to make it Petra when it's actually Petros, and they say, oh, the difference is Aramaic and Hebrew. That's the difference. So it's a Catholic rendition of a, of a certain verse trying to get you to try to believe that the Catholic Church is the, the rock that Jesus Christ founded the church on, Peter, instead of Jesus Christ himself. So it's not really a concept for concept theory because Hebrew and Aramaic are not the same. Although they may have some similarities, they are not the same. So the words are important. It's not just the concept. The words are important. Then you have something called the mechanical diction theory. Again, these are all theories. And this one is that the scribes were inspired in the act of being a secretary and writing down what the Bible says. Right? In this sense, this is where a lot of your biblical historians will land, the originals were inspired. Right? You hear me say that? The originals are inspired, but then they've not been preserved. Right? That's where that, that's where that camp falls into. And then there's one other one. There's one called the verbal plenary inspiration. Right? This is God chose every word used in the writing of the Bible. Right? He's, he's writing... Um, and the writing people, people who wrote the Bible, people who translate it, were also inspired quoting the words. So we subscribe as close as we possibly can to the sixth one, although I think there's some flaws and holes in that. The bottom line is the Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but his words will not pass away. And Psalms 12, 6, and 7 says the words of the Lord are pure words, right? and that he will preserve them from this generation forever. So he inspired them at some point. I believe he is still inspiring the scripture today, right? Because this book is powerful. When I read it, the words hit me. That's inspiration. They breathe life into me. That's inspiration. That's literally the word, what inspiration means, right? God breathed. And then God breathed into Adam and made him a living soul. He inspired Adam is what he did. He inserted, uh, in, inserted something into him, right? He inserted uh, something with weight into him that had meaning. That's what inspiration is, right? This book is still inspired today. God is still inspiring this book, but he's also preserving it. Inspiration without preservation doesn't mean anything, right? If he inspired it back then but didn't preserve it, what good does it do? They both, they both go hand in hand, right? So then you have these people out there that say, well, he inspired it in the, in the Texas Receptus. Now, if you know anything about those manuscripts and all that stuff, the Texas Receptus is, is the, the, the stuff that brought us the Greek New Testament, right? The received text is what that Texas Receptus means. So the, the original Greek was inspired, but nothing else was inspired. Well, what good does that do man? You know what that makes God? That makes God a wimp. It makes him somebody that can preserve, that can give us such powerful words that can change our lives, but then he doesn't have the authority or power to preserve it. And I don't believe that. I don't believe in any of those. Uh, and the verbal plenary ones, they get wishy-washy. Right? Every word of this Bible is not only inspired, but it's preserved. Every single word. That means when there's a word in here that I don't understand or there's a word that I don't like, I have to figure out what it means and I have to change my belief to suit the Bible, not my, my Bible to suit my belief. When we, approach, when we approach the scripture with the concept of, I want the Bible to show me something that says this, God will show you something in the Bible that says that. And he'll let you believe a false, a false doctrine because of it. He put his words out there for us to have. And it's up to us with, to approach this book with a contrite and proper heart. If we want to find false doctrine in this Bible, we can find false doctrine in this Bible. We can. We can find it. We can find justifications for all sorts of sin in this Bible. All we have to do is take a few verses out of context, and there we go. We have our excuse for sin. Right? 
That's how these people, that's, that's how the charismatics speak about, speak about tongues. That's how the, the, the baptismal regeneration people, that's how the people who think you have to go get dunked in water in order to get saved, well, that's exactly what they do. They take, some content, they take some verses out of context and they don't read the chapter and, and they don't think who's talking and they don't think who are they talking to and what's the point of the conversation, right? So when it's a Jew talking to a bunch of Jews about a Jewish problem, that's probably not going to be something that I'm going to take my doctrine for, right? It might be something that I can use from a practical standpoint. It might be good advice, but doctrinally speaking, doesn't necessarily apply to me. So that's where people get confused with all these things. It turns out we can't really put inspiration in a box. Inspiration is a supernatural thing, and we try to put man-made words to it, and it doesn't, nothing fits. Nothing fits, right? Um, Paul used inspired words in Acts chapter 17, right? But those words were not his, right? In Acts chapter 17, he is, follow, he is actually quoting a poet and philosopher from 230 B.C. Don't ask me to pronounce his name. It's like one of those $12 words, right? It's huge, right? So uh, 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 another one he did is in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. He, he quotes... Uh, and a poet, um, in a Syrian poet and a philosopher um, to write to Titus. Now that was a phrase that he used in Titus chapter 1 verse 2, 1, 1 verse 12, was a well-known phrase in the region. That's why he used it, right? Um, but Paul didn't write it, so was it inspired? Well, if God told him to write it, then yeah, it was inspired. Right? That's the way it is. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Does anybody know that verse? Has anybody ever heard that word? Well, all scripture is given by inspiration, right? If you have a King James Bible, that's what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration. Well, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Well, who's he talking about? He's talking about Moses talking to Pharaoh. Is what Moses, Moses spoken words inspired? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. That's scripture. You know what a pastor does when he stands up behind the pulpit and he says, thus saith the Lord? He's quoting, hopefully he should be quoting something from the Bible, right? If he's misquoting from the Bible, guess what? That's not inspired. If he's quoting something from the scripture and using it in the context that it's, inspired, that it's intended to be in, guess what? The words that that man says behind the pulpit is scripture. And all scripture is given by inspiration. Right? It doesn't have to be just the words that we have written down here in our Bible. It can be the words that we say. So this whole putting inspiration inside of this box on how we got this Bible doesn't necessarily work. Right? In Jeremiah 36, God tells Jeremiah to write some things down. What he tells him to write down ends up being chapters 45 to 51. Right? But Jeremiah did not write any of them. Did you guys know that? Did you know somebody else wrote it for him? A man named Baruch wrote it for him. So, which one was inspired? The things that God told Jeremiah? The things that Jeremiah told Baruch to write down? Or the words that Jer Baruch wrote down? Which one was inspired? All of them. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Right? Inspiration is not one singular thing. God has given us this book through an inspired revelation. He has given us an inspired revelation, and we have it in the palms of our hands. And I think that people miss, they don't understand, the, the, the common man doesn't really understand what they have in their hand when they, have, when they say they have a Bible. They don't really understand what this is. This is every word that God says. In the English language, I have every word that God wants me to have in the English language. Do you know what a blessing that is? I mean, do you know what an advantage that is in life? And people don't, they just, they just don't really understand what God did to keep this book. Has anybody actually read the history of how we got the Bible? I'm a history guy. It fascinates me. Most of you, would, as, uh, my wife, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call you out, you'd be asleep in about four minutes, okay? She's not a history person. That stuff doesn't, doesn't mean anything to her. She knows. She puts it on faith. 
I believe that God gave me his words. I don't need to know the history. I just know that God gave them to me, right? I love the history part of it. But the things that God had to do on this earth in order to get us this book is fascinating. It's, it's a miracle. It's, it's like the existence of the Jewish people today. It's a proof that God really does exist. This book right here, being inspired, is proof that God really does exist. I don't need an external proof. I have a proof, right? Just like the nation of Israel. If the nation of Israel doesn't say, you know, those people have been through the ringer so many times and have had their backs against the wall 99 times and they've come out successful 100 times, that, that's, the odds are not in their favor. They should have been a wiped out people, as many people that have tried to destroy them throughout history, right? That, just the fact that the nation of Israel exists lends the, lends the idea of a God just like this, having this book in our hands does, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, none, of those, none of these theories, even the verbally plenary inspired that most of the Bible believers plain, claim to use, fit inspiration, right? So how do we know what Scripture is and how we got it? Well, at some point, and this is a quote by Sam Gipp, at some point, you're just, gonna ha- you're just going to have to allow God to be God. At some point, you're going to have to allow God to be God. Well, that's not good enough for me. I need proof. Well, then you don't have faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right? You have to take some of these things on faith. I can't, I can't track down every manuscript that was used to translate this book. Some of them don't exist anymore. What does that mean? I have to take it on faith that that's really what it said? Yeah, you do. You have to trust that God was in the process. And if you can't, then that's something that you have to work out with God. You're going to have to allow God to be God. I can't believe how, I, I mean, I can't explain how Jesus and Paul came to the same conclusion. And when it became inspired or scripture. I can't tell you that, right? But what I can tell you is that I have it in my hands. <clears throat> Some things we can't explain, the how, sometimes we can't explain the how and the why of things. And that's just, that's just everyday life, right? We just don't, we can't explain the how and the why. And that's just is the way it is. That's what faith is. Bottom line, Jesus, Paul, doesn't matter who said it, they're both inspired. Both are scripture, right? Some sow, some reap. Is that a true, is that a true statement or is that not a true statement? Then who said it, it doesn't matter. Right? My pastor in Indiana always used to say, the truth is the truth. It doesn't matter who says it. Does that make sense? So what happens if Mao Zedong said something that's true? What happened if, by accident, what happened if Hitler said something that was true? It's true, right? Regardless of the source. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying go listen to all of Hitler's stuff because that's, he's, he's messed up in the head, okay? I'm not saying go listen to Stalin and, and Karl Marx and all these things. Karl Marx says some true things. Do I want you to go read Karl Marx's material? No. We don't want no commies in this, in this state, you know, in this country. Uh, bad enough the commies are coming from California over here to, to Florida. We don't need any more of them, right? So the point is it doesn't matter who says it. If it's true, it's true. Um, And that's something that we can take, uh, that's something that we should take out of what we do read, right? We read the news media and we try to say, oh, well, you know, they're all biased and all that other stuff. Well, yeah, but sometimes they do actually give you a glint of truth, right? And so you take the truth and you throw the garbage away. I think Dr. Ruckman used to say, uh, when, when, when you got a meal that's not completely edible, you eat the meat and you pick out the bones. And what do you give the bones to? You give the bones to the dog, right? You take what you can get out of it. That's why whenever I go somewhere and I go to a church that's not a King James Bible believing church, I won't approach the the, I won't approach the sermon with the concept of this guy's a liar. I'll approach it to say, hey, what can I get out of it? Right? And then you throw the garbage out and you take what's good. You can get something from anybody if you look hard enough. Some guys, you really have to look hard. But you can get something from anybody if you look hard enough. All right, verse 38. It says, I sent, I sent you to reap that whereupon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. <clears throat> Sometimes we reap 
what somebody else labors. Is that not true? That's true too. The apostles were reaping from the Old Testament prophets. They were. John the Baptist reaped from the Old Testament prophets, did he not? I am the one of the, vo I am the, one of the voice crying in the wilderness. They were looking for John, pardon me, John the Baptist. They were looking for him. Jesus gained disciples because he says, I'm that Messiah, right? He's reaping on some of the groundwork that the Old Testament prophets had done. We all do this. <clears throat> um, Philip reaps from Isaiah in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, right? So when we... When, when, when something happens, when God brings somebody our way or we are put in the path of somebody else and we just happen by some chance to get talking about something and then we witness to them and they get saved. You don't know that that might have been the result of people putting years and years and years of labor into that person trying to get them right. And I had to come from a different source in order for them to understand, right? So, um, <laughs> pardon me. Sorry about that. So, uh, it just happens to, it happens to come from that, uh, from that source at that right moment. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit doing that work, right? Um, and, and sometimes we pick up what other people have labored on. However, you can take that too far if you look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 20. You have these people who consistently try to build on somebody else's work, right? And you don't want to do that. This is, this is Romans chapter 15, verse 20. It says, Yea, I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. What is he trying to say? Uh, find your own corner. Don't, don't plant yourself on somebody else's corner. I would be upset if another Bible-believing work came and put itself right across the street. Right? What's he trying to do? Build upon the foundation that I'm working on here. That's not profitable for either of us. Right? So what, what, what I guess what he's trying to say is that don't but if the opportunity arises, give the gospel, right? Um, when somebody has, has put years and years and years of effort into a work and they write a book and then you take their book and rewrite it, you just you're a better writer than he is, Right? What have you done? You didn't do the years and years and years of work. You're laying your, found, you're laying your work upon another man's foundation. That's not right to do, right? Put in the work, right? Okay. So you can, you, can, you can reap other people's labors. That's okay, right? Don't seek out other people's labors to reap. That's, 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 a, that's a heart problem within the person, right? Don't be a sheep stealer. If another man is called to a work, don't steal it. Don't steal the rewards, right? They're not for you. They're for somebody else. You have your own work. You have your own calling. Don't steal somebody else's. You don't need to steal anybody else's. There's plenty of work to do. We read it, we read it last week when he was talking about the field being white and ready to harvest. There is plenty of harvesting to do. You don't need to steal another man's work, right? Build your own, right? Um, you may lose, um, you may lose converts that, but those, but those that steal your converts, they'll, they'll see something at the judgment for that. They will see something at the judgment for that. God does not take kindly to that. He says many people have come in my name, but they're not mine. He doesn't take kindly to that, right? All right, verse thirty-nine. The result of the conversation. Remember, we're still talking about this peop these people at the well, right? So what happened? He spoke to this lady at the well. She went back and told everybody, hey, you know, um, this man has to told me everything that I've done. And many of the Samaritans came out. And it says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. 
for the saying of the woman. Before they ever even talked to him, they believed, right? Which testified, he told me all that I ever did. It says many believed. Nicodemus ended up believing. Nicodemus ended up believing. He was of the religious elite stripe. This woman believed. She was of the unsavory woman stripe. Right? The Samaritans were not Jews per se. They were a half breed, but they believed, and many Jews, like many Jews, did. Look at verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word. So they believed because some believed because of the woman, and some believed because they actually went and spoke to Christ. Right? Jesus simply revealed his deity to them, and they believed. And this is how we should win others. This is how we should win others, by revealing Christ to others, right? Revealing Christ's deity to others, revealing Christ's authority to others, revealing Christ's power to others, revealing Christ for what he's done for you to others. That's a great way to win, win people to the Lord. You're not going to get people in mass droves doing that. You know what? You know what, that, you, know what that, you know what that details? That it details you putting in some time with that person and say, look, I got this... He doesn't watch, so I'm going to say something. <laughs> I have this friend from high school, right? I have this friend from high school. We were very close in high school, right? And, and not so much the Christian. And then when I got saved, things started to drift apart. And then certainly after I got married and got serious about the Lord, things really started to drift apart. I don't talk to him today, right? But every once in a while, when he sees that I'm, you know, active on Facebook or something, He'll message me through Facebook, and he'll say, oh, boy, you know, you got your act together. You've always wear this and that. And all. He's drunk, drunk as a skunk, right? And he's telling me how, you know, uh, I've always done this right and always done that right and always done it. Look, it's not about that, right? My testimony, right, to him is a witness that I'm doing something right. And that he is not. But he won't change. He won't change. He'll never accept what, I, what I've accepted. At least, at least not coming from me, he won't. Because I've tried, right? I, I, I've put in some, a little bit of time with that man, right? Somebody else is going to have to come along and reap it, right? And hopefully the Lord sends somebody his way. What? Pride might be a part of it. I th you know, pride is definitely a part of it. Part of it is the way he was raised, but you can't really bank on that because I was raised the same way he was. You know? In some ways worse, in some ways better. But, um, you know, it's just, I, I broke the mold in my family. He, he, he won't break the mold in his family, right? Um, so it's, it's just one of those things where we reveal Christ to others. What, did, what was he doing? It wasn't just that he was drunk and he was, text, and he was texting me. It was that he saw Christ in me. At least that's what I would like to think, right? I'm not trying to make myself something that I'm not. I'm just trying to say, I have something that he wants. He just won't go get it, right? He's going to have to make that choice. But, and, and, when we do that, your testimony can be a witness for somebody, right? Now, this woman, this woman, it says that, um, and the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. This woman did not have a great reputation in the city, I dare say, right? Having so many men in her life, so many husbands that weren't hers, Right, especially the one that she has now that wasn't hers. I doubt that she had the greatest reputation in the city. But something, something let some of these people understand that something she was saying is true. What was that? That was the Holy Spirit. Well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament like we do today. They did. They just didn't understand it the way we do. Right? Holy Spirit was still working. They just didn't really have a concept of the Holy Spirit the way we have a concept of the Holy Spirit. All right, verse 40. 
So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that they would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many believed on his, because of his own word. This often happens, right? When people find out who Jesus is, they try to keep him where they're at. You remember the men in Luke chapter 24 that were on the road? And this was after the crucifixion, and there was two men talking about this guy that they crucified in Jerusalem. And Jesus is standing right there on the side of the road, and they walk right by him, don't even realize it's Jesus. And he says, hey, who, what you talking about? And he says, where you been? You got your head stuck under a rock? He, he says, we're talking about the one that, the Messiah, and they crucified him. And he walked with them, and he allowed them to think that he didn't know anything about it. And then once they got to a point, he stopped him and talked to him. And, he re and the verse says, this is it's such an amazing verse. It says that he revealed all things concerning him, right, in the scriptures. Do you know what that means? Do you know what kind of a, a blessing, do you know what kind of a Bible teaching they got right there? That was from Genesis chapter 3. Actually, Genesis chapter 1, because Jesus was there too, right? All things, every mention of the script in the scripture, what did they have at the time? Genesis to Malachi, right? They had that. Genesis to Malachi. So Jesus went through every reference in the Old Testament concerning him. That must have been an awful long walk, right? And when they got to the end of the road where there was a fork in the road, Jesus made as if he was going to go one way. He wanted to go with them, but he made as if he was going to go another way. And what did they do? It says they constrained him. You must go with us. You must go and eat with us. After this walk, I can't let you leave. You need to continue to come and talk with us. They, they were getting so filled with Scripture that they didn't want Christ to leave. Can you imagine having that, that feeling? I mean, just a minute. Can you, can you imagine Jesus Christ teaching you all things concerning Him? Well, we have that opportunity today, just not in a face-to-face -face application. And we, these men got it face to face, and boy, what a blessing that! I mean, that I mean that to me is just is one of the most fascinating verses of Scripture in the Bible. Because I, I don't know if they understood what was going on there, but we have the hindsight of the Scriptures. We understand what was going on in that verse, and I don't know if they understood. And because even then, even at the table, they didn't realize who it was until he broke the bread and gave it to them, and they saw the nail holes in his hand. That was when they realized who they were talking to. They just thought they were talking to some guy who knew the Bible. And, it, their, and their eyes weren't opened until they saw the nail holes. Right? And then what happened? And then Jesus was gone. Gone. Uh, they certainly knew he was different. They certainly knew he was something special, just like the woman at the well did. I perceive that thou art a prophet, right? And just like these men constrained him, hey, ye, come with us, come eat with us. The people of the Samaritan city called him and says, you need to stay with us. And he abode with them two days. And in those two days, they had a revival in the town. And many believed on him, right? They came to see Jesus because the testimony of a woman, verse 39, and Jesus is the one who, and Jesus is the one that they heard and they believed on. So don't don't ever sell yourself short. This woman was a, this woman was a woman of ill repute in the city, and she won people over to Christ just by saying, "You got to come see this guy." You know what she did? She said, "Let me tell you about a man I met at the well." She said, "Let me tell you about a man I know named Jesus. Let me tell you about him." Don't ever think that your, your witness can't be used. He, he used a woman who had no reputation in the town. Well, she had a reputation, just wasn't a very good one. Right? So if you think you, can, you can't do anything for God, well, if he can use a woman like that to win the people that she's wronged, why can't he use you? He used the testimony, the, the speaking words of a woman to bring people to Christ. And many went out to the well, and those people got right. And then they brought them back into the town, and many people got right. Why? Because a woman was bold enough to say, I need to talk, show you this guy. Man, he's amazing. I, he's more than just a prophet. All right, verse 30, 43, he stayed two days, 
and then went back on his journey to Galilee. Verse 43, And after two days he departed thence and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And this is unfortunate. This is an unfortunate and sad truth. That many often, many man, many called, called man of God often experiences. This is why when God calls a man, he usually removes him from where he's at and puts him somewhere else. Because it's hard to be fruitful and preach and build a work and to be used by God. It's hard enough to be to do all those things. A man that is doing great things in the name of God, right, in his hometown, with his own family, often doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Because why? Because to them, you're still little Bobby or little Billy. You're not a, a called man of God, right? It's hard for somebody to... To gain, to gain any headway in a town. Like there's, my town in Indiana is a very small town. There's already a Bible-believing work there. So I knew if God was ever to call me, it would never be in the same small town, right? And I, was, and, and I thought about going to, to Rose Lawn, the town that I grew up in, and maybe doing a church there. I wouldn't get anybody there because they knew me. They knew the old me. My family, my mom still says, oh, please. I haven't talked to my mom in quite a while. One time I talked to my mom. She says, you believe that? I said, I believe that. She goes, I know better. Because I know you when you were. Yeah, that was the old me, mom. I don't believe that. I don't do that anymore. That's not me. That was the old man. It's hard for a called man of God to, to make any headway with his family because there has to be a drastic change in your life in order to get their attention. Has to be. And even then, they'll accuse you of putting on a show. Trust me, I know. They'll remember every argument, every wrong that you've done. They'll remember all of those things but they won't listen to what you have to say because they will remember those things. They will forever see you as their son or their grandson or their cousin or whatever you are to them, the troublemaker from down the road. They'll, they'll always remember you as that and never as somebody who's doing great things for God. And that's a shame because Paul had a heart for his people. Paul had a heart for his people. And God would let him go back there because of his testimony. Not just because of his testimony. He already had somebody there. He called Paul for a specific purpose. Said, Paul, you're the apostle of the Gentiles. But he really had a burden and a heart for his people. Did he not? He didn't get a whole he didn't get very far with his people, did he? Everywhere he went, did you notice what Paul did? Everywhere he went, you know, every time he went into a town, you know, the first place he went to was the synagogue. He had a burden in the heart for his people. God says, you can go ahead and win those people. You're not going to Jerusalem. Why? That's where he was from. That's where he was from. <clears throat> Jesus ended up going to Galilee, and they received him there. If you look at verse 45... And when he was come unto Galilee, the Galatia, uh, Galileans received him, having seen the things, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. He left, he left the area that he was, where he was from and went somewhere else because they wouldn't receive him there. But he went somewhere else and they gladly received him because of the, the mighty works he did. Why wouldn't they receive him where he was from? Did Jesus have a bad testimony? Of course not. Of course not. That's just, that's human nature, isn't it? And, and in verse 45, he says, And when they came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen the thing, seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. This was John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Verse 46, he said, so Jesus, so Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, 
where he made water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Um, he met a certain man. So it's not a parable. It's not a parable. Okay. He met a certain man, and he was a nobleman, nobleman, and he was a man of means. And when he heard Jesus was back in verse 47, he sought him for the healing of his son. His son was sick. And the son was so sick that he was to the point of death. And that's verse 47. And when he heard Jesus had come out of Judea unto Galilee, and he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. In verse 48 he says, uh, and Jesus said to him, Except ye see the signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. He didn't really care about the... Well, look at verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. In verse 48, when he says... And Jesus said unto him, Except you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. I don't think he was talking to the nobleman. I certainly don't believe he was talking to the nobleman. The nobleman had showed great faith in coming to him, right? He wasn't talking to the nobleman. You know who he was talking to? He was probably talking to the Pharisees that were around, or the unbelieving Jews that were around, or even his disciples, yeah. Sometimes they had a hard understanding, what was hard time understanding what was going on, right? And I don't think he was talking to the nobleman. I think this was a shot across the bow, right, to the people that were around him. Um, of course, he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. Of course, we know what 1 Corinthians one twenty two says, that the Jews require a sign, that they, they're an unbelieving people, and they have to see something in order to really believe it. They're an unbelieving people. They're a stiff-necked people. So I don't think it was for this certain man a nobleman from Capernaum, Capernaum. Uh, I, think, I think this was really a shot at the people that it was around him. And in verse 50, he says, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Because see, his response is, A nobleman said unto her, son, son, He said, Sir, come down ere my child die. He didn't care what the comment was to the Jews. He didn't care about the contention between Jesus and the Jews. He didn't care about what was going on behind the scenes between Jesus and the Jews. You know what he cared about? There's a man that can heal my son. Right? There's a man that can heal my son. Now, which one of us wouldn't, wouldn't go to the ends of the earth for our, one of our children? Right? That's what he did. That's what he was doing. And he didn't care about the contention between Jesus and the Jews. He wanted his sick boy to get better. And Jesus responds simply by telling the man to go home. He didn't do anything fabulous or fantastic. He didn't, you know, wave his shirt coat around and, and do all this other stuff. He didn't smack him on the head and make him go into convulsions. He didn't do any of that stuff. You know what he said? Go home. Now, if he'd have just said go home, the man would have persisted. <laughs> as I would have, right? As any parent would have. He said, go home. Your son lives. Okay? And it says, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way, right? So uh, he, he, he went home. This showed tremendous faith because he had no outright evidence that his son was going to live. Did he? He had no outright evidence that his son was going to live. Nothing, nothing was there other than the words of Jesus Christ to make him believe that his son was going to be okay. But it says that he believed, right? And this is, this is very much like the time when Jesus turned to his disciples and says, oh, oh, ye of little faith, if you would have that kind of faith, we can do stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, you know, if you just, man, if you guys just believed like these people believed, who was he talking to? His disciples. The people that were with him. And he was going home, on his way home, verse 51, we'll end in 51. And it says, And now he was now going down, and his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And as he was going home, one of his servants came along and tells him <clears throat> that his boy has been recovered 
and he must have been overjoyed. He was obviously an intelligent and a spiritual man because he asks a vital question in the next verse. He asked, when? So most people would have been, what do you mean? Wait, what do you mean? My boy lives? Amen. And run. Let's go. This man stopped and says, when did he start getting better? He was obviously intelligent and he was obviously spiritual because he had the forethought to attribute what was going on to, the, to Jesus Christ. Okay. We're going to go ahead and stop right there. We're not going to be able to get into 51 and 52 yet, just quite yet. Any questions or comments about what we went over? He was overwhelmed with joy. He certainly must have been overwhelmed. I mean, he went through a hardship to try to try to get to find Christ in order to help him, right, get saved, get right, not get saved, get healed, right? And he was willing to pursue Christ until that was accomplished, right? Of course, I think he was overjoyed, but I would be too. But he he still had the the wherewithal to thank God in the moment, right? And say, when was he healed? So he can say, yeah, that was about the time that I spoke with, with that man. That really is, he, the man really is who he says he is. Praise God, right? He had that wherewithal. That's not something that we often do. We don't often attribute the things that happen around us, even when we try to make it happen around us, just like this man did. And we pray for it, and we pray for it, and pray for it, and pray for it. And then when it happens, we're like, all right, and not the, thank you, Lord, or not the, boy, Lord, how'd you handle that? One? How'd you make that work? Or anything like that. So he was obviously a spiritually minded man, and obviously a very faithful man, and obviously a very intelligent man. All right, anything else? Lord, thank you so much for this blessed book. I pray that you help us to, to take these words and uh, let it find some, some soft ground to fall upon, and and uh, help it to, uh, to, to, to gain some ground and take root. And Lord, thank you for being so good to us. And Lord, thank you for showing us your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you for the book you've given us. Thank you for the son that you gave us. Uh, Lord, without all that stuff, man, I don't know where I would be. And we owe all that to you. So thank you for everything you've done for us. I pray that you continue to be good to us. I pray that you put a hedge of protection around us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.